I was held in Bagram. Yes. It was a horrible place. I saw prisoners murdered there. Yes. But the place I was held was built by the Soviet Union. Right. And you could still see the writing in Russian on the walls. Yes. I was with a young man and his name was Sharif. Mm. And he told me how his father was buried alive by the Soviet forces right outside where we were being held now by the Americans. Oh, no. Right. And I remember one day he stood up in front of the Americans and he said, you know, you, the Soviet Union buried my father alive outside. Do you think his son's going to bow down to you? The war on terror, a US-led strategy that saw deadly interventions in the Muslim world, has transformed a generation of Muslims. Some, like my guest today, unwittingly got caught up in this mindless campaign, and 21 years after the events of 9-11, we still feel the after-effects of the programs that placed every Muslim in categories moderate or extreme, good and bad, loyal or disloyal. Marsan Beg, a former Guantanamo detainee, upon his release, has been a tireless campaigner for the truth, exposing its lies and deceits. In the process, he and his organisation, Cage International, have tactically contacted non-Muslim sympathisers and wider human rights organisations. But I asked him about the risks involved in this strategy. Many a time, Muslims that receive such support are forced to compromise. The left wants Islam to change and come with various social positions we find problematic. The right often possess a chauvinism that calls upon Muslims to accept a secondary role in society. I asked Mu'azzam Beg to conceptualize how he navigates these binaries. I also asked Mu'azzam to update us on the current state of the war on terror. Is it over as a US state policy? And if so, what does this mean for us as a Muslim Ummah? Raghum Azam, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah, and welcome to the Thinking Muslim podcast. Wa Alaikum Assalam, Rahmatullah wa and my pleasure to be here. Jazakallah Khair, thank you very much for, for coming today. Raghum Azam, you've been together with your organization, Cage International. You've inspired a form of activism in the Muslim community that I feel is unique in the West. Today on The Thinking Muslim, I want to explore the work of CAGE and your thoughts about the current state of the war on terror. Has it ended as a policy of the United States, as it concentrates to look at powers like China and Russia? And I would like to focus on how you navigate some of the pitfalls that are associated with the political activism in the West. Now, the last time we spoke, you were without a passport or the ability to travel. Have things improved for you? Um, well, yes and no, uh, in the sense of I have my passport back. Mm -hmm. uh, I have it back because we had to judiciary review the government. And before we did that and take them to court, they capitulated eventually and did give my passport back. But then uh, it's one step forward, two steps back, because I, I've traveled to about six countries since, my re since the return of my passport and have been denied entry into at least two, being detained in airports for three days, four days, and one day, um, and uh, stopped every time I travel when I come back to uh, good old uh, Britain. Yes. So yes, I do have the passport back. I can travel in some places, but in other places I can't. And, and on what grounds do they stop you for? The grounds uh, are always to do with national security, things I can't see, things I can't challenge, um, and decisions I think, that are still connected to Guantanamo. Really? Yes. I mean, the British police know you very well now. The government knows you. They know that you were exonerated after you were released from Guantanamo. So on what grounds would they still stop you at, at the airport? There are no grounds. Oh. The grounds that I've discovered so far is a uh, uh, what I've seen in disclosure in some litigation I'm doing in another country Yes, is uh, the basis comes from Guantanamo. Uh, yeah evidence extracted through a time when torture and murder was taking place of prisoners yes. and still continues to be used by the US government um, to send notices to various uh, countries that yeah. get me to, uh, stopped at airports. Right, okay. And, and when they stop you here in the UK, what sort of questions do they ask you? I mean, are they meaningful questions or just... No questions at all. Really? Yeah, they're not, question, they're, they're not going to question me here. They, they, they know that this, it could be a, a, a can of worms. Right. But what happens is I get stopped at the at uh, at the uh, at the border, yes. um, at passport control, yes. and then wait for sometimes half an hour, forty five minutes, an hour, 
um, whilst checks are being done to see whether I really am a British citizen, though I've been born and raised and lived here all my life for 50, 54 years. SubhanAllah. Well, may Allah help you with, with that. Um, so let's talk about Cage. I mean, Cage has successfully advocated for persecuting Muslims around the world. I know the government has maligned you in the process. In fact, there's a Shawcross report coming out, which I think you guys are center stage in, in, in that report as, as being those, uh, that type of organization that the government finds abhorrent. But interestingly, interestingly, you've received a lot of good support from a number of non-Muslims. And I want to explore that, especially those human rights uh, organizations and those in the legal space. How have you nurtured these relationships? Well, ultimately, a lot of these relationships uh, grew out of Guantanamo, where everybody kind of recognized, especially from I mean, the Muslim communities in particular, but we're talking about the non-Muslim, the majority, the human rights activists, the lawyers and beyond, even politicians. Um, so we've had people like Joanna Lumley um, share the stage with me, share um, events with me, uh, Russell Brand, uh, prime ministers, presidents I've met across the world talking about uh, Guantanamo. I've met Imran Khan, I've met the uh, Deputy Prime Minister of, of Luxembourg. Yeah. We've sit, shared pictures together in the media and all around Guantanamo. People want to show that they believe Guantanamo is abhorrent. Yeah. But there's also, in extension to that, there's a different part of it which people don't like so much. So it's easy to talk about Guantanamo, but it's not easy to talk about home and about a Guantanamoization of legislation that's happened here in the UK. Yes. Um, so the one part, it's been relatively easy in fact, in, in one sense, there were probably more non-Muslims campaigning uh, effectively against Guantanamo than Muslims were. You can hardly think of you know, famous Muslims or well-known Muslims who actually did that, yes. prominent Muslims. Yeah. Whereas there were plenty of prominent non-Muslims. Uh, Vanessa Redgrave, for example, has been a great campaigner and a great friend uh, in campaigning against Guantanamo. Yeah. But you'll get not get somebody equivalent from the Muslim world um, that's been able to do that. Why is that? Uh, I think primarily because of fear right. uh, in the beginning. Um, and that was maybe palpable. Uh, Muslims were told that this is essentially a war against you. There, there, was, no, there was no pretense. Yes. Uh, George Bush said that you're either with us or with the terrorists. In this war, there's no Switzerland. There's no Sweden. There's no, there is no middle ground. Yes. Um, so I think that fear, the fact that we're in minority, minority here, the fact that the Muslim world from Morocco to Indonesia participated in and was complicit in uh, the, the torture programs uh, is also a reason. So torture perhaps wasn't known to be connected to the, to, to the West until uh, the war on terror began, yes. but we knew that it, it was connected to the Muslim world. Yeah. And that's why most of it was outsourced to those places. So unfortunately, I think the Muslim world, the Muslims here in particular, uh, were frightened and not only that, I think they were ready, to, many were ready to abandon their principles of Islam. In other words, to sell down the river yeah. those who they, they knew very little about, who hadn't had their chance to have their day in court. You talk about the outsourcing of the war on terror and how many of the Muslim capitals, Muslim countries were used and utilized by the West. Has there been a reckoning in any of those Muslim countries, in Pakistan, in Morocco, in Syria, uh, with what happened during that period? Well, that's a really, really interesting question. Um, the answer, you know, the, the overall answer is no, there hasn't. Really? Not, not in, in terms of, a, of a, uh, a legal case or in terms of anybody being held to account or the International Criminal Court or anything like that. There has been a reckoning in the sense of one of the things that sparked the Arab Spring was the continuance that was the normalization of torture. Yes. I remember once speaking to somebody when I'd gone to, to Egypt and to talk about Guantanamo. They said, we have hundreds of Guantanamos here. Guantanamo is normal here. And in fact, one of the ironies was, was that prisoners who were freed uh, or, or released f or due to be released from uh, Guantanamo couldn't go back home to places like Libya, Egypt, Tunisia yeah. uh, uh, and beyond because of, ironically, the threat of torture. Tell me about Afia Siddiqui and her current uh, place. She's in prison in the United States. Um, What's the opinion in Pakistan, uh, the current opinion in Pakistan regarding Afia Siddiqui? Has, you know, has, has, uh, I know there is public sympathy for her, of course, but has there been a movement in the political elites, in the army, 
Pakistan. Well, you know, I, I said that I'd met Imran Khan before he became prime minister. Yeah. And one of the things that we spoke about you know, at some length um, was Afia Siddiqui. He was yes. very passionate about her. And right. Yvonne Ridley at first uh, approached him after I told her about the screams of women I used to hear in Bagram. Yeah. Um, we don't know necessarily whether that was Afia or not. But, but what we do know is that uh, uh, Afia was held for a period of time in Afghanistan. Yes. Uh, and her children uh, disappeared. One of them totally disappeared, and and two were held with her for a short period of time. And after all of that, my my, my lawyer, the first lawyer who visited me in Guantanamo, Clive Stafford Smith, yes. has recently just come back from visiting Afia Siddiqui. Really, and he says uh, he met her literally last week. He said that uh, she's clearly she's damaged, very damaged, psychologically damaged, and that's really sad because if you. I read a post recently from from uh, Yasser Qadi who said that he remembers when he met her at, uh, at um, when he was a, a young freshman, yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, he, he was lost. And this this woman came, his sister came along, and she was very confident, and uh, and she told him which direction to go, and 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 that was his interaction with her. Mm. And that's so different to what she is now. She's a she's she's literally seems to have lost her mind. She's been separated from her children now for close to twenty years. Yes. Um, uh, her mother's died while she's been in prison. I met her mother when I went to Pakistan about 10 odd years ago. And her mother, mother was a very strong woman, but all that was very damaged by what had happened to her daughter. Yeah. I want to return to a role played by sympathetic non muslim like uh, Clive Stafford Smith in a second. But with just on the uh, Afia subject, um, there is sympathy in Pakistan. Pakistanis are generally outraged at what happened. Um, we get a lot of listeners to our podcast and viewers now from Pakistan. I mean, what can they do to help resolve, alleviate her suffering? Well, ultimately, there is something that, that Pakistan as a government can do. Right. And there is, a, there is a, um, an agreement, uh, a treaty that Pakistan could sign which would, uh, with the United States, which would essentially mean that Afia Siddiqui could come back to Pakistan and serve the rest of her sentence, whatever that sentence is going to be. In Pakistan, they could do whatever they wanted to. Um, and that would at least bring her close to her family, to her children that she's not seen in all this time, and to the rest of her family members. And also that would placate those who've been saying that uh, Pakistan actively does not want Afia to return. And there is a strong, uh, strong evidence to say that Pakistan doesn't want her returned, really? especially the intelligence services. Um, but that aside, there is, as you say correctly, not just in Pakistan, but even the diaspora community, everywhere you go from South Africa, to um, the UK, to Norway, to wherever you find Pakistanis. That's one of the first things they ask me whenever I'm being interviewed. Yeah. Well, let's turn to these non-Muslim sympathizers, those who really believe that the war on terror was unjust and it maligned the Muslim community. And we've got, I mean, there's plenty of people on the left and probably the right who are very sympathetic to your cause and to our causes as Muslims. I suppose what I want to explore are the red lines. Uh, I've noticed that more often than not, there are many Muslims in the West who engage, who team up, who ally with non-Muslims. But somehow this horribly goes wrong. Um, they cross those red lines and after a while they begin to exhibit some of the qualities that those non-Muslims exhibit and make compromises to their deen. How do you and how does your organization CAGE deal and navigate these problems and challenges. Well, you know, this has always been a fine line to tread for even us, especially the, the work that we've done with sometimes yeah. from the left and uh, you know, rarely, but sometimes also from the right. Mm. Um, in, in the end, we have to remember we're neither left nor right. We are Muslims. Islamic uh, history and uh, civilization has its very distinct, unique um, uh, contribution to history, civilization. Uh, and that is what we are the inheritors of. We're the inheritors of the, of the, the prophets and, and of the Anbiya and the Rusul. And that essentially means a path in which you will be targeted. We understand that. Um, sometimes our, our views will ally and align with, uh, with the right and sometimes with the left and sometimes with neither. Mm. Uh, so, of course, during the first years of the war until the very first decade or so, it was clearly the right wing that seemed to be our enemy, George Bush's war on terrorism. Yeah. And uh, the left allied itself with Muslims, the anti-Iraq war uh, protests and so forth. Uh, we found a lot of support there. Uh, but I think one of the catalysts that kind of bought, a, that showed a, a fault line uh, was Syria. 
And then, of course, later with what's happened in China with the East Turkestan. Yes. And here we find that our principles will, to quote the phrase, trump uh, those of alliances with either side. Yeah. We, we respect those who work with us who are not Muslims, and we expect the same in return. Um, and it is important that we lay down that these are the lines that we cannot and will not cross uh, in terms of our uh, our belief system. So if it means endorsing, because if they, if say it's something from some some group or organization from the left endorses and supports uh, a matter in relation to prisoners without uh, in prison without trial, yeah, we thank them for that and we, we we welcome that. But if then we're asked to reciprocate by saying to endorse something that is wholly um, uh, not permitted in Islam, then we can't do that, and we'll tell them straight. I'm thinking about. I mean, there are people. I mean, we don't have to mention so many names. I mean, George Galloway comes, you know, a, he's a politician, of course, uh, who uh, who endorses a lot of position, particularly towards Palestine. I mean, the left are very sympathetic towards the Palestinian cause, mm -hmm. but they're silent on the Uyghur genocide, as you as you quite rightly mentioned, and on Syria, as you said. You know, people like Tariq Ali had a very very horrible positions on, and they saw it. They they saw Assad as a savior, as an anti-Western savior, as as opposed to a uh, you know someone who was committing horrible barbarisms against uh, this Ummah. How much can we accept their sympathy or even their alliance when we know they hold some of them hold very stringent and strong anti-imperialist positions, but those anti-imperialist positions are diametrically opposed to the, our Muslim sensibilities. Well, I th again, uh, I think some of these issues, some of them are about our religion right. and they're, they're about uh, the halal and the haram, which okay. we can't overstep. But some of them are about political alliances. Okay. And those, as you know, change all the time. Yeah. Um, so as an example, I can say that one group of very strong, hard left um, uh, supporters of our work actually allowed me to write in one of their magazines about the Uyghurs. So right. I published an entire ar article about how uh, the Uyghurs have been targeted because of their religion. They've been targeted because of George Bush's language of the war on terror, which which China actively used. Yes. And they've been targeted because actually, if you look at um, the language of the of, of the left, for example, they'll talk about anti-colonialism. Yeah. Well, everything that's been done to the Uyghurs is an, as a project of colonialism of Chinese Mandarin uh, colonialism on distinctively Turkic uh, Muslim uh, Uyghurs. Uh, and that's clear for anybody to see. So we have to, I think, kind of recognize that when it, where it is there. But for the large part, I mean, let alone the left, you've seen Muslims, Muslim countries, Muslim nations endorse China's treatment of the Uyghurs. Yes. And there's nothing that hurts the Uyghurs more than that. I've spoken right. to them often and they said that Nothing harms us more than than Muslim Muslim nations yeah. endorsing the Chinese government's treatment of. After all, they're trying to remove our religion from us and and make us into atheists. And I think that's worse uh, than anything that happened in Guantanamo. So on on that subject, um, I think it was just last month there was a Human Rights Council meeting that was just going to debate the Uyghur genocide. It wasn't uh, anything which anything meaningful beyond that, uh, but uh, the debate was blocked by Muslim countries. Qatar, who you wouldn't imagine would block uh, a, a discussion on the Uyghurs, uh, blocked, blocked it. It was only Somalia, I think, as a Muslim country that uh, decided that uh, the, the debate should go ahead. So why? Why is there such antipathy, such why do Muslim countries fear China so much? Well, I think one, one is fear and the other is rely. Right. So you can take Pakistan as a, as a, as an example, a country that relied heavily yes. on the United States yeah. and destroyed its own country. I'm one of its victims, handed over without any legal process to the Americans, a citizen of Pakistan. Yeah. And they did that with thousands of people. And the the war in the in the northwest against the the Pashtuns, the, the tribes, the Taliban, uh, at least fifty thousand of their own people killed for nothing. I mean, Kashmir, they've not killed, they've not fought that number of people who have died in, in Kashmir in all of these years. They've not mm. tried to even attempt to liberate it. Yeah. So I think Imran Khan recognized that the reliance upon the United States and its uh, agenda yes. was harming Pakistan. But there's a trade-off and the trade-off he made was China. And uh, he, he became blind to China's treatment of the Uyghurs next door. Yeah. Uh, 
And in doing so, I think a lot of Muslim countries do the same thing. We've had enough America. We know what America is capable of. We've seen America in Iraq. We don't like it. Some of them may have, ta- may have taken part, but they'll, they're will kind of hedging their bets with China, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and you can see one of the examples, the largest number of Islamic goods uh, produced, manufactured, are in China. Yeah. So it's not like they have a problem with Islam in those countries. They have a problem with Islam in their country, and particularly, not even in their country, in the region that is autonomously, historically speaking, uh, East Turkestan. Let me come back to Imran Khan and the Muslim leaders and how they navigate some of these concerns or these problems for for the Muslim Ummah. But just on the subject of non-Muslims and and gaining support from non-Muslims, you know there are Muslims out there who say any form of alliance that Muslims have with non-Muslims is a sellout. You know, you're selling out your your deen, your Islam, and it brings nothing but trouble. And we should only rely upon ourselves. They'll even cite examples from the seerah, from the Prophet ﷺ, which... uh, imply at least that uh, Muslims should have nothing to do with non-Muslims in terms of political support because they always this, this support always comes with trade-offs. And, and there is a popular opinion out there, I think, on social media we hear it all the time. How would you respond to, to such arguments? Um, you know, in, in the West, it is, it's really important. I mean, there are, there are Muslims who say that you can't even seek a, 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 a judgment in the court sure. because doing so is to remove Allah's uh, um, position as legislator and the Quran's legislation and, and you're seeking judgment elsewhere. So those, those who, who say that, yes. but the majority don't say it. The majority said that you, are, you don't have a choice in the matter. Yeah. Um, and in, in, the, in the same way, when you're trying to seek alliances from people from the West to get rights, to get, for example, prisoners released or to get, for example, various aspects of Islam uh, livable for, yeah. for Muslims in the, in the West. Yeah. I think that's... Uh, we have no better example in the Prophet's life than Abu Talib. Yes. And the Quran actually states about Prophet's relation with Abu Talib. You were not able to guide who you loved. Hmm. The Quran bears testament to the fact that the Prophet loved his uncle, who was a mushrik. But Allah guides who he wishes. So he spent his entire life, of as long as he was alive, defending the Prophet ﷺ in every way, form, and this is, you can say this is as, as a relative, but it's also a very strongly political act. Prophet ﷺ also mentioned about Hilf al-Fudul, he also mentioned about Mut'im bin Adi, who he said that if he'd been alive, I would have for his sake yeah. uh, free prisoner. So you've got all of this. Um, people can argue that the Prophet ﷺ at one point was in strength, a position of power, but at the time of Abu Talib, he wasn't. Yes. Uh, uh, so he was in a position of weakness, actually. Uh, politically. So I don't think there's a problem with that at all. And we have plenty of examples of Abu Talib like characters that we come across, Gareth Pierce, Clive Stafford Smith, yeah. a whole bunch of other people. Yeah. Um, so I don't think there's a problem with that at all. And, I, and I, I'd be surprised if anybody says that this compromises our faith. Yeah. If anything, they see uh, a lot of the lawyers we've dealt with in Guantanamo and elsewhere, some of them have become Muslims. Really? And that's because they see how we operate. And I'm talking about senior, in some cases, I can't mention the names at the moment, but very, very senior lawyers who marched with Martin Luther King and strongly left-wing civil rights type lawyers who took the Shahada after they interacted with some of the brothers. There are some left positions. Uh, We've discussed the political positions like Syria and and, uh, the Uyghurs, and these positions are very problematic. But also increasingly here in the West, there are positions that are possessed by the West on social issues, you know, on marriage, on family, on children and bringing up children. And again, these concerns are becoming hotspots of problems in the Muslim community in terms of how we navigate these. And and again, uh, relationships with non-Muslims, especially someone like yourself or your organization, you would have relationships with people who may personally endorse those opinions. And, you know, they may send a tweet out or a Facebook post out in defense of the prisoners of Guantanamo. But at the same time, they would, you know, uh, be endorsing social positions, which are very problematic for us. Again, how would you navigate and deal with uh, these positions? First of all, it's clear. Let's put aside whatever somebody else's position is. Let's ensure that everybody knows what our position is, who we are, what's our identity, what's, as they say in Arabic, what's our hawiyah, what's our identity. And we clarify that. And to that point, our enemies and detractors will say, 
use terms like, oh, they are Islamists. They are at X. They've already put us in a box. We don't put ourselves in those boxes, but yeah. they do. Um, so whoever comes then to our support or to our help on a social issue recognizes from the outset who are these people. Yeah. They, they know it very, very clearly. We don't, we don't um, hide who we are. We don't pretend who we are. Mm. Um, but I think one of the other things that you'll see is that, and it is unfortunate, you know, I'm from the city of Birmingham where you had these protests outside the schools for what was known as the No Eid Saudis program, which yeah. is the, the implementation of, a, of an LGBT kind of friendly um, uh, program in the schools where the, almost 99% of the children and parents are Muslims. Yeah. We didn't see ulama and leaders of the community come out in defense of those parents' rights. We saw street activists, people who, some who had earrings in their ears and some who didn't know anything about Islam really, other than the fact that I'm not allowing this for my child mm -hmm. and I'm demonstrating outside. And there was interesting because some people from the left called them extremists. Yeah. And some people from the right came down to their defense. Yeah. And I'm talking people like, I'm not joking, Katie Hopkins. Really? Katie Hopkins came to Birmingham and to show some side of sort of twisted um, support for the Muslim community. Yes. And you've seen people like Tommy Robinson recently say that I used to be very much against Islam because I thought they were doing all of this and all that and all that. But now actually on this matter, they're the ones holding the ground. And so that's a, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult terrain out there, right? You've got the left who support us on some issues. You've got the right who support us on some issues. But then the left also have got real problems with Islam as a comprehensive dean. And the right probably have a lot of racialized viewpoints about Muslims and, and, and probably want Muslims to be in their little box and in their place and not have, you know, not have... Um, uh, delusions of grandeur or whatever, however they would, would phrase it. Um, it's a difficult world we live in in the West. I mean, how, how do you deal with that? I was held in Bagram. Yes. It was a horrible place. I saw prisoners murdered there. Yes. But the place I was held was built by the Soviet Union. Right. And you could still see the writing in Russian on the walls. Yes. I was with a young man and his name was Sharif. Hmm. And he told me how his father was buried alive by the Soviet forces right outside where we were being held now by the Americans. Oh. Right. And I remember one day he stood up in front of the Americans and he said, you know, you, the Soviet Union buried my father alive outside. Do you, th you think his son's going to bow down to you? Yes. What does this tell us? Sometimes it's the right, sometimes it's the left. The Soviet Union, when they were the, when they were the enemies of the Mujahideen there, yeah. they fought them in the same way as that they fought the Americans. Yeah. They saw them as an occupier, these are an occupier. Um, at that time, it was the, the, the right. Ronald Reagan was the great friend of Muslims. Great, yes. Actually, he was a friend of Mujahideen. He called the, Mujahideen, they're like our founding fathers, <laughs> right? And uh, he said, what do they call um, Siraj uh, Jalaluddin Haqqani, the head of the Haqqani network, right? Yes. Uh, goodness embodied. Yes. Personified. That's, so they will use all sorts of, of names and terminology to describe Muslims, and they will use it as well. They'll support the concept of jihad when it suits them. Yeah. Mujahideen were great at that time. Yeah. Um, and then, so what we've got to remember is that we don't really care. Yes. You, you can call us what you want. You can be left. You can be right. I don't care. These are my principles. Agree with me, follow with me, help me, support me. We, we're greatly respectful for you. But if you don't, we're going to carry on. So is your advice to young Muslim activists, I mean, we, you may come across Muslims at universities who are naturally inclined towards politics, towards oppression, uh, towards justice, as, as of course all Muslims should be. But it's often a heightened feeling within, within young Muslims. Would you advise them first to study Islam, to be clear about what Islam is? I don't, I don't mean go on a six-year course or anything like as extensive as that, but to have a, a good Islamic background before they venture into the political minefield. I mean, you can have a good Islamic background in, in terms of knowing your five pillars, right? And, be, and adhere to those, right. but still be completely politically unaware, completely politically illiterate. If we, for want of a better term, yes, and, and because you think I don't want to get involved in that stuff, other than at the point at which you're forced to, and then you 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 don't know how to make the choices that you're making. Yeah. You don't know whether it's right or wrong. You don't even know whether you need to seek advice from somebody. Yeah, and so these, as I said, these questions are are important, and I believe that it's fundamental for any Muslim to be in to be grounded properly in not just your Islamic theology but also 
your political understanding of the world in which you're operating, especially if you're going into places like activism and, and human rights, because you need to know the parameters. You even need to know what does human rights even mean? Uh, human rights here doesn't necessarily mean human rights in the Muslim world. Yeah. And when you're talking about human rights across the board, are you saying that we're fighting for, for example, a man to transition to a woman? Is that part of, because that comes under the universal um, language of human rights. Yeah. So you have to be very specific. Yeah. Human rights, when you're talking about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, one of the rights there is the freedom of expression mm. to say anything you want to about what, whoever you want, yeah. including the prophets. Yes. And even the 1990 Cairo Declaration, which was the kind of the, the Muslim world's response to it, yeah. which happened in Egypt of all places, they recognize that there's a red line, yeah. that we will not allow any, uh, we will not accept the um, uh, disparaging of any of the prophets of Allah, for example. Uh, so we have to understand when we're fighting for and calling for human rights, what are we talking about? So that's an interesting uh, point. Uh, the language that you utilize in your political <coughs> activism. So human rights, equality, freedom. I, I suppose this, these are terms that we naturally use when we try to express solidarity with Muslims in Palestine or with the Uyghur Muslims. But of course, that, as you quite rightly just mentioned there, those words often mean something different to the non-Muslim than they do to, to Muslims. So as you said, you know, uh, Brunei was condemned, or Qatar was condemned recently for its human rights abuses. Right. Uh, Brunei for its, you know, for its stance towards LGBT, and so 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 as Qatar. And of course, we we don't have a particular problem with those rules. We think that uh, Islam has a very clear social safeguards, and and one needs to maintain those. Is it useful then to use these words like human rights and equality and freedom? I, I think we have to. There has to be a constant. Reviewing of language right. because language is developing all the time. It's always changing. Sure. Look at the word racism. Yeah. There's no you don't find racism essentially in the Quran and the Sunnah, but you find jahiliya, and in jahiliya you find nationalism, you find tribalism, yeah. you find um, racism. You find all of those things. They do exist. Not like they don't exist. Sure. Um, incidents of racism happened at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but they were dis described as jahiliya. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he saw one Sahabi describing another in, in, a, in a derogatory way because of his his racial lineage, lineage, he said, that you still have ignorance in you. Um, so we have to kind of recalibrate our language yes. and remind people uh, that Islam has its own set of ideals. Yes. And they are a, they're a set of ideals that don't change. The principles of those don't change. The language may, over periods of time, be relevant because we're speaking English, for example. The, you know, even the term racism in the Arabic language, the racism in Urdu. Mm. It, it, you struggle to find them in the same way that you find them in, in English because the English speaking, the English world has been deeply traumatized because the because the the type of racism that existed here. Yeah, yeah racism exists in every society, but really slavery and the way that was carried out during the Atlantic slave, slave trade was of, as of, of a new level that human humanity has never witnessed before on that scale. So they've been traumatized by it, and we shouldn't inter internalize what they've been traumatized by. Your organization, CAGE, is an advocacy group, and you organize meetings, you um, generate public opinion, you try to uh, shed, focus uh, some light on the pain and suffering that uh, Muslim communities face around the world, and you do it very effectively. How much is your work also, how much do you integrate within your work an educational aspect. So I often come across uh, young Muslims uh, who are at university and uh, they are largely influenced by the left's rhetoric on campus. And so at a very early stage, and even though, I mean, these young Muslims may have studied Islam, they may, as you quite rightly said, they may know about the Farai, they may pray and fast, but when it comes to political matters, they don't have a firm grounding within any Islamic basis, right? And and so the only people who speak in a way openly about politics are the left on campus and they embrace and adopt those opinions. How much or how important is it from your perspective? I know you have finite resources and I appreciate that, to, but how important is it to, to sort of develop those political ideas within a new generation of Muslims? So we try to, I try to myself, uh, yeah. give examples, for example, of, you know, if you want to know, you want to talk about the fascists, you've been going, you know, the left talks a lot about the fascists, but yes. really, when did you ever fight the fascists 
in the battlefield. Sure. The first people to fight the fascists in the battlefield were the Muslims of North Africa, uh, Omar al-Mukhtar and the Sanusi movement and, and the Khilaf actually. Yeah. Because the fascists actually were born as a movement in modern times under Mussolini and he uh, invaded and occupied Libya. And it was the Mujahideen, history shows it was the Mujahideen uh, that fought against the fascists. Uh, they fought for the Islamic courts, they fought for the Islamic system, they fought um, believing that when they get killed, they go to, to Jannah as shuhada. Yeah. That's who they were. Yeah. So we want to remind people that these anti-colonial movements that existed, um, Muslims played a big, big part in them. Whether it was Russian colonialism yeah. in Chechnya and Dagestan, people like Imam Shamil and Sheikh Mansour who fought against that, whether it was the French, uh, Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi, or whether it was in Morocco, Ab Amir Abdul Karim al-Khattabi, who defeated a force of 16,000 um, Spanish troops. We want to tell people that there's a, there's a in con relatively contemporary times, uh, a history of Muslim resistance, fighting back. Yeah. That you don't need to go to all the other places. You don't need to go to Sheikh Guevara. You don't need to go to uh, Ho Chi Minh. In fact, Ho Chi Minh, Sheikh Guevara, and Mao Zedong studied the tactics of Abdul Karim al Khattabi, who defeated all those uh, uh, Spanish. Uh, so we want to kind of reclaim uh, the Muslims' role in, and, and their principles. We remind them, yes, their principles perhaps were uh, anti colonial at that time, which would kind of align them naturally to a, 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 a leftist narrative. But they were Muslim. Yeah. Their ideology was Islam. They fought for Islam. They fought for their Sharia courts to not be superseded by the courts of the uh, the, the colonial occupier. I suppose you get you get my. I mean, you, you know, it's a great great answer. But you get my point. There is a uh, a generation. There are a generation of Muslims on university campuses who are either apolitical. I mean, if I was to be harsh, I would say that many of the Islamic societies tend to maybe for perfectly reasonable reasons. They tend to navigate away from controversial political issues because they don't want to be assigned or labelled as extremists uh, and prevent and all of these uh, projects probably contribute to that. Or there are Muslim, and, and as a result, those Muslims who do, who are inclined in that way, they, as I said, you know, embrace the left's rhetoric. Uh, you know, do you feel, as I do, that there is this gap in, in political consciousness from an Islamic perspective in the young generation? Or are you more hopeful maybe uh, about uh, I, I'm I'm telling you I'm more hopeful because yeah. when I, I remember, I'm just giving you my, my personal experience. Yeah. Like when I came back from Gitmo, you know, for the first few years, the Islamic societies were terrified to invite me to yeah. speak. They, yeah. they were scared. All the, the leftist societies, the amnesty societies, <laughs> the stop the war societies, yes. I was getting invited all the time. So right. it was, you know, I had a strong relation with the, with the West. Yeah. I, I remember we were doing events with with left organize, leftist organizations about Afghanistan and Iraq. Right. And in the same building, there's an event by the Islamic Society about um, the upcoming Ramadan. So look how disconnected they were. They were so disconnected yes. from what, and that was the height of the occupation of Iraq, right. where you know thousands were getting killed. Um, and I think that fear has changed. Really. And part of that is because they've been targeted themselves. That the Muslims. Uh, under prevent uh, the constant effect, not even drip drip effect, it's like a daily dosage through the media, politicians, prime ministers. And now for the first time, I think in recent times, Muslims have got, Muslims have got a little bit of a break and that's because of Ukraine. Right. Uh, but we could even talk about that, but that is it. That's the break that we're getting. Yeah. Um, otherwise the war on terror was business as usual, attack, bomb, drone, arrest, laws, Laws and wars on terror, as I call it, we're, yes. we're in full swing. Well, let's talk about that break. Um, is there a wider phenomena here? Uh, do you think that the US war on terror is now over effectively with, as I said, the rise of Russia as a, as a global actor? China, of course, is this big problem now for, for the West. And, and hypocritically, they're, they're now discussing the Uyghurs from the perspective of you know, undermining China. But there, are, there is now, after this period of 20 years, there is a very recognizable threat, a state threat, rather than non-state actors in the form of so-called terrorist groups. Is the war on terror effectively over? No, I think it's, it's, it's needs a different stage. And, you know, it's really important that we understand this. That what I was interviewed on the Xinhua uh, news agency, which is the Chinese state news agency. And what I said was, the, I said something about America and it was actually tweeted out by the Chinese foreign office. Huh. Amazing. Yes. But they didn't tweet out the rest of what I said. Right. 
because they asked me to talk about America and they wanted to bash America as China would love to do by talking about Guantanamo and how terrible it is. There's only 35 prisoners left there now. Yes. And I said, and they said, would you like to say anything at the end of it? And I said, yes. I said that what Guantanamo, what has been done in Guantanamo, the Chinese have done on an industrial scale in East Turkestan. Mm. Whilst there are a few hundred in Guantanamo, or they were at some point, there are millions imprisoned in China under uh, the Chinese government in East Turkestan. And the difference is, is that American soldiers, some of them accepted Islam. Mm. What China does is try to remove Islam from the hearts of the, of the, of, uh, the children and, and the adults. Mm. Uh, and America never did that, to be fair to them. Mm. Um, but they never, they never tweeted out that part or that part of the, yeah. the interview. And so China has adopted that language. Uh, I think Xi Jinping was reported to have said that we need to use Bush's language of the war on terror in order to, um, to paraphrase, in order to uh, quell the Uyghurs uh, uprising or whatever. Russia has repeatedly used the language of the war on terror to call those they were fighting, uh, whether it was ISIS or anybody, in fact, or, anyone yeah. In, yeah. in Syria in particular, okay. called them terrorists. Anybody from the Syri Free Syrian Army all the way to ISIS, everybody mm. on the opposition. Mm. Uh, of course, Chechnya is another place um, where for decades they were calling them terrorists. Mm. Uh, and India uh, and Burma and all of these places have, have easily adopted that language. You say the word terrorist, you delegitimize the Muslims. And in that way, the war on terror and its language has gone is, is, is gone full circle. Yeah. Everybody's adopted it. Let me ask you about Afghanistan as we're on the subject of Biden and the retreat from Afghanistan. Um, again, it's it's one of those. I mean, politics is a confusing place, right? And we uh, we uh, we would uh, as Muslims find it uh, amazing that lightly armed farmers, effectively in Afghanistan, were able to defeat the world's biggest superpower, probably the biggest superpower the world has ever seen uh, in terms of military strength and economic strength. Um, uh, but at the same time, um, after the Taliban have bedded in and established their own political system, we also see that, and again, you know, one needs to be wary of what we pick up here, but we do see that the Taliban are banning, for example, women from girls from going to school. And um, there are a number of positions that have taken recently, which are a little problematic, at least from a mainstream Islamic perspective. So how do we view Afghanistan? Is it a success story for us as Muslims? Or is it something that we should feel ashamed of? Well, first of all, let's look at uh, This wasn't just the United States taking part. This was actually NATO. True. So this is not the most powerful nation in the world. It's the most powerful nations, plural, in the world, including Britain and France. Yeah. So it's like the, it's three of the uh, uh, permanent members of the Security Council, nuclear nations. Uh, they dropped on Afghanistan what was known as, they called it the mother of all bombs, uh, a 22,000 bomb, pound bomb. And that was after they dropped 15,000 pound bombs. So they'd used everything in their arsenal other than nuclear weapons. Yeah. And they still could not defeat them. Um, so I think that alone, everywhere else throughout the Muslim world, you're seeing defeat after defeat, after occupation, after invasion. Here's one place, at least if nothing else, yes. Muslims have the right to allow them to celebrate that they have defeated the political will of an occupier to stay the course of the occupation. Yes. Uh, with regards to, of course, they've, they've, they've won the war. How do you win the peace? That's a different matter. Um, I was there in Afghanistan when the Americans had invaded. I saw the carnage, tens of thousands of people killed and bombing and chaos. Everything I've read thus far and saw from that point the Taliban, when they took Kabul and Ghazni and Jalalabad and all the major cities, took them without firing one shot. The chaos only happened when ISIS carried out that, that bombing, when the Americans were evacuating. And that has its own story. So that has to be, it's got to be seen in it, in, 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 for what it is. The other sh amazing thing for me, truly amazing thing, is that several of the five of the uh, Taliban, senior Taliban who held with us in Guantanamo are now all senior ministers in the government, including the Minister of Defense <laughs> and you know other governors, the Minister of Information and so forth. So I, I think even those, just from, just from a, a perspective of, of, for me as a prisoner, it's a, it's a huge victory. Yes. It's a massive victory. You can't imagine this is something of, this is, this is something you read books about. It's Mandela type stuff. Mandela's in prison for decades. These guys were held for 14 years. Mm. 
what remains is their treatment of women, uh, the role of women, and all of that stuff. And I agree, there's things that they've said that they were going to do that have not happened, or that they've said they were going to do, and there's been a, a, a seems like a 180 degrees turn on that, mm. including the issue of, of education. My only thing I would say is that from what I've understood and what I've known as somebody who's, who ran a girl's school, I ran a girl's school in Talib and uh, in Afghanistan when the Taliban were around, is that they don't want Western agendas. And they're very suspicious of them, anybody. And, and the Western agenda has been in there for the past 20 years. And they want to completely eradicate and move that and replace it with their system. Mm. I think that's what's in their minds. But having said that, um, I think there are clearly mistakes being made. But there is, uh, from the youth of what I've seen, from the youth of, of, of even of the Taliban and what's in Afghanistan, mm. is that they're not going to accept, they're not going to accept a return to the past. They're going to go forward and it's good. They're going to, they will take their women with them, but it's going to take time. Let's talk about uh, the Uyghurs and the persecution. As you said, it's an industrial scale persecution undertaken by the Chinese regime. And uh, there's little public opinion or international opprobrium uh, uh, regarding uh, the Uyghurs. People don't really talk about this subject. And when they do, it's very short-lived. Um, even the United States, who is uh, in this current conflict with uh, China, there's a trade war and there's all sorts of uh, uh, conflicts uh, uh, between the US and China, yet um, the Uyghurs factor as a side point, as a, as a small uh, as a small blip on on their on their schedules and on on their rhetoric, how can we um, focus more attention on the plight of the Uyghurs, and how can we sustain that as a Muslim community? Well, you know, we spoke about the left and the right, and, yeah. and, and kind of those alliances or meeting or changing, not necessarily alliances, but but interests. Yeah. Uh, I was at uh, a, a a tribunal, a people's tribunal, a couple of, uh, last year, uh, in which it was found that the uh, Chinese government was carrying out a genocide against the Uyghur, Uyghur mm. people. Mm. Uh, and genocide, in, mostly it was cultural, other than the fact that there were forced sterilizations being carried out against Muslim women en masse. And for that reason, they said it's a genocide, right. as opposed to physically taking people and putting them and killing them. There was a different, there's different forms and, and uh, definitions of genocide. And amongst those people present, uh, were right-wing politicians. Mm. I mean, politicians, if I was to name them, you, you'd know all of them, and, and they are right-wing politicians. Yeah. And it saw us politically on the same side, as it were, say, as seeking the same thing, which is the sanctioning and the targeting of the Chinese government for its treatment of, of the Uyghurs. Um, but it's true. They are, a, they are a, a, an afterthought in, when it comes to politics, because China is such a, t a strong power, yeah. militarily, a permanent member of the Union Security Council, um, independent, uh, powerful, a powerful nation. Yeah. Um, and as we've seen, the Muslim world has capitulated entirely in front of it. Uh, and the only one standing against it in any way, shape or form is the West. Yes. And so we don't, we don't, we can't say anything to our Uyghur brothers and sisters who have nowhere else to turn to. Mm. Your heart breaks for them. Mm. Um, what we've seen in Britain, I think, is, is being unique. There have been Muslim groups and organizations who've organized the largest ever non-Uyghur protests anywhere in the world in London. And I think that's something for us to be proud about. It's, it's sim still not enough, yes. anywhere near enough, yeah. but it becomes a little bit of a, of a story, at least for the Uyghurs when they hear it. But in practical terms, I think we can't pretend. Islam is going to be wiped out there. Mm. There's just no other way to look, unless there's a liberating force comes to get them out. This isn't even like the occupation of Palestine, where there is a movement of resistance, where they do, they do fight back in Gaza and so forth. There is. Here, it's not going to happen. Here, Islam will be wiped out. And the way they're doing it is very systematic. They just go for the next generation, put them through indoctrination. By the time they're teenagers, they don't know a single thing about Islam. Um, and that will be jointly the entire Muslim Ummah's fault, particularly those who lead us. Yeah, it's a very worrying situation. I mean, I, I, uh, I spoke about the UN Human Rights uh, Council vote. And, but there are countries, as you said, you know, Imran Khan, who supported you over the Afia Siddiqui case, or at least uh, rhetorically supported you when he was in power. Nothing really changed. 
But on the Uyghur issue, he has been uh, very much on the side of China. Unfortunately, of China. Imran Khan's position is that whenever he's asked about the Uyghurs, he yeah. starts talking about Kashmir, yeah. which is fine. Let's talk about Kashmir. And India, yes. Yeah, and, and Pakistan's not done anything about Kashmir either. Yes. Um, they've spent more time, more effort, more weapons, more military in in Pakistan fighting their own people for the Americans yeah. ever than they did for Kashmir. And if that's the case for Kashmir, what are they going to do for the Uyghurs? The, the truth is nothing. What about the role of Turkey here? I mean, Turkey, again, aspires to be a country that uh, stands up for Muslims and Muslim rights. And uh, many Muslims around the world, I mean, maybe it's Eritrea or one of these, but many Muslims around the world, uh, they, uh, they like Turkey and they believe that Turkey is the next hope. Uh, and Erdogan is a, uh, you know, is a leader who's got a strategy to, to employ to, to help the Muslim Ummah. Yet Turkey has done very little to support the Uyghurs. Um, and um, in many ways, it colludes with the Chinese government like any other country in the world. Well, I mean, the Uyghurs are Turks. Yes. Or, or, or they're the original Turks. They are the original Turks. The Turks migrated across Central America, Central Asia, sorry, and settled in, in Turkey. So, that, it's, so it is a natural place for, Turk, for Uyghurs to gather, and it is the largest, the largest number of, of um, uh, Uyghur... Uyghurs resettled around the world have resettled in Turkey. There's massive numbers of them in Turkey. And they periodically have protests there, which the government sometimes stops, but generally they allow them. Um, there was, I think, a couple of years ago, uh, a, a statement made by Muslim countries, this is before this recent one, in defense of China and its treatment of the Uyghurs. There were two countries that abstained, abstained yeah. and that was Albania and Turkey. Sure. So that seemed to be a little bit you know, better than, than the others. Um, and that may have something to do with the Turkic speaking speaking people, of which the Uyghurs are, are are many in Turkey. But ultimately, yes, it's another power, a strong power, um, NATO power, powerful military country like Pakistan, a nuclear power that you expect a lot more from. And again, uh, you could understand if it's war. Yeah. War then becomes a political thing, and uh, people have the right to fight. If somebody is attacking you, fight back and. But here, it's not war. What's happening in, in China is, again, I say, in East Turkestan, it's not war. It's a systematic removal of your religion yeah. to make sure that the next generation will no longer be Muslims. And that's, it sounds soft because it, it, there's, there's no real physical uh, conflict taking place. Uh, but the Uyghurs that you meet tell us, that I meet, they tell me often that... It, my relative is no longer a Muslim. Wow. He's an atheist. Really? My nephew, my niece, so they're atheists now. They, they, not because they chose it. That's all they were taught. They were, it's, they were literally forcibly indoctrinated. And that's why China's fantastic at doing that. The, the re-education camps that they used to have for communism. They're the ones, the masters who, they, they're the ones who created the entire system. So it's easy for them to do that. Let me ask you about Cage and its activities. I mean, there is an asymmetry here when it comes to your work and the work of these states like America, China, even Russia in Syria and, 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 other, and Chechnya beforehand, these are states with immense amount of power, with an immense amount of soft power as well. They have the ability to change public opinion. They have the ability to malign Muslims who defend themselves in Palestine. And uh, when there's one attack against uh, Israelis, uh, then the, the world's press highlight it and make it the only issue in that conflict. So, so they have the ability to change the narrative. Organizations like CAGE are um, small organizations. Alhamdulillah, you're effective and you've got some very uh, strong personalities who are able to endorse a, a, a strong message. And as we've said today, you've got some very clear Islamic red lines. But nevertheless, you're not a state actor. You don't have the resources of a state. Do you sometimes feel that CAGE is really working against this... this uh, 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 this leviathan of of um, power that works against this ummah is there hope in in your work? Yeah, if there was no hope, we wouldn't be doing it. You, right. you, you know, and as a Muslim, you're not rely, you're not allowed to be hopeless. Let right. you, know, you can never be hopeless of Allah's mercy. Yeah, we believe it. Uh, ev uh, even now, as things are, are happening, and and from the point I can remember, my consciousness, Muslims have all been always been oppressed yes. in in modern times. Right, there's not never been a period of time where I think. Muslims haven't been in conflict in one place or the other. Yeah. It seems to get worse and worse. It doesn't seem to get better. Um, but nonetheless, Muslims and the message of Islam is spreading in a way 
that is uh, it's unprecedented. You know, Andrew Tate's one example. I don't take him as an example for me to follow personally, but you can see that everybody's talking about it. As I said, even even haters of Islam. And we know this from us, from the seal of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, those who hated Islam, Umar al Khattab, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to make dua for them to become Muslim. Yes. Before anybody even thought about it. Sure. They said, oh Allah, give izza to Islam from Umar al Khattab to or, or Umar ibn Hisham. Abu Jahl, he's making, uh, making dua for Abu Jahl to become Muslim. Yeah. So this is clearly happening. Islam is, and it's not just it's spreading because it's a trend. People are seeing that there's an attempt to change the fitra of human of mankind. Mm. There's an attempt to change them, yeah. the very nature of man. And the only people standing firm, not buckling in front of this is Muslims. Everybody else has, has, has literally capitulated. Um, so in that regard, I remain hopeful. In the regard of what you're talking about, fighting these great leviathans of yeah. nations and how do we take on their narratives? Of course, it's, it's, it's a, you're a you're one soul drop against an ocean. You, it's easy to get swallowed up, um, but we hope that that drop creates a ripple, and that ripple eventually, as you know, with the wind, can create a hurricane. That's very true. Um, your organisation, Cage, has recently rebranded, if that's the right term, to Cage International, um, and and I suppose that reflects the more. I mean, it's always been a global organization, I suppose, mm -hmm. but uh, it reflects um, the, the wider array of, of concerns that you've adopted. So tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so the only reason we really call ourselves international is yeah, our, our work was born out of being international. In fact, yes. most of it wasn't to do with what's happening in the UK. Yeah. It was only afterwards. Uh, but we began with Guantanamo, which by necessity was international. Yeah. Uh, the reason why we international is because Cage has set up offices in um, Austria and France wow. in particular. Fantastic. And those two countries are, are places where Islamophobia there looks makes Islamophobia in the UK look relatively tame, especially in relation to France. Yes. Um, so in, in, in Austria, there's been a, a, um, an Islam act, as they call it, where Muslims have been kind of put under the purview, uh, under again, under anti-terror legislation based upon the attacks that took place in Vienna uh, a, a, f a few years ago. Uh, and then, of course, in France, there's been law after law and discrimination against Muslims right from the top from uh, Sarkozy to Macron and beyond uh, and it seems like that those countries are even they're, they're way ahead in the hatred the demonstrable hatred of Muslims hmm. uh, of some a place like Britain seems like a you know a safe haven by comparison uh, on that uh, subject of Britain, I mean, do you feel, relatively speaking, uh, in Europe now, Britain is probably, of course, with all the caveats, with all of what you've mentioned about the war on terror and the projects and the policies, and uh, but with all of that in mind, Britain seems to be a better place in inverted commas than most of the uh, countries in Europe. And I, I came across a, a Muslim recently from Algeria. He's a chef and... Uh, uh, he had been in Germany for a while and he had been in France. And of course, he said there's nothing but discrimination in these countries and Muslims get a very bad deal. And, and even simple things like prayer becomes a very mammoth task in, in these places. Whereas in Britain, uh, with all of you know, everything that you've said today, uh, Britain is relatively speaking a better place. And I know that's a very low standard, but do you agree with that sentiment? Absolutely. Yeah. Completely. And I think that a lot of that has to do with how Europe itself has developed, right. how they got their own freedoms through a lot of, a lot of bloodshed, yeah. uh, re uh, revolutions. Be, you know, the word terrorism comes from France. Yeah. The, Le Grand Terror, the Great Terror, when uh, the entirety of the uh, French bourgeois, uh, you know, uh, ruling cl class, w were all killed by the by the guillotine. So, France was literally born out of head chopping. Modern France, right? Mm. And and uh, they preserve thousands of heads of skulls in the Louvre to, 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 to prove it. Yeah. The, the, so they have a very bloody past in relation to religion, in relation to the freedoms, in relation to their identity. Britain has a bloody past too, but nowhere near as comparison in comparison. Yeah. Nowhere near as bloody in comparison. The biggest thing you had was the, you know, the civil war here. And I think that kind of reflects in the people. Even British colonialism, it was bad. It was very brutal but nowhere near of what the French did in, in, in uh, Vietnam, in Algeria, in th this, I kid you not, this stamps from the 1930s that show French foreign legionnaires 
with beheaded captured prisoners. They were a macabre people. They were a, a brutal people. And I read how one of the executioners, he would sit next to the guillotine with a knife. And if the head wasn't chopped off properly in the hole with the, with the, um, with the guillotine, he'd sit there and s cut off the rest of the head. That was the official position of France. And that was in the, you know, in, in the last century. Uh, so, yeah, Britain in comparison to these guys are, is, is, is tame. It, it is more to tolerant. And I think we should recognize that. And we have, as a community, built ourselves institutions, uh, people, uh, and even those including like H, who get targeted by the government all the time and yeah. get stopped and bank accounts closed. And, but we, are, we couldn't exist in France. We couldn't exist in Austria, couldn't mm. exist in Spain. Yeah. Do you think the Labour Party would be better for the Muslim community under Keir Starmer if, if they came to power, which is almost inevitable now if, in the next election? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. Um, I think Keir Starmer is a Blairite, so, right. you know, 2.0. I think Keir Starmer, you know, I remember when we gave evidence um, to the police about the role of MI5 in our torture. I mean, actually being present when we're getting tortured. Yes. He was the... Uh, chief prosecutor of the country at the time, the, the, the head of the, uh, what do you call it? Crown Direct, Prosecution Service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the Director of Public Prose Prosecutions. Yeah. Um, he refused. He refused to, uh, to take that, to, to take it where its natural course would have been, which is the government is not above the law. Yes. They committed a crime, torture and false prison are crimes. If government members did it, then they have to be prosecuted. Yeah. So, uh, no, Rem let's remember, as uh, for all those Labour supporters, the war on terror began and was uh, and its chief architect was uh, under tony blair yeah uh, so i don't expect any great things happening if keir starmer leads the labor party into government and what's next for you uh um Wazim? what's your um, intentions i mean how you how you acclimatize into um uh, the the new environment you said that the war on terror is is, is moving to his second phase um, how are you and your organization acclimatizing to that second stage? So we're trying to speak more now to yeah. people from the various communities we've mentioned. As of course, the Uyghurs yeah. have a strong link with the Uyghurs, not least, least because there were 22 of them in Guantanamo with me, so I got to know them very well right? Um, and still do. And, and they say that we thank Allah we were sent to Guantanamo, not to China. Really? So that tells me everything I need to know about their experience and what they, how they see things. Yes. Um, and at the same time, Guantanamo is still open. We're still fighting for prisoners. Uh, to be released from there. There's still 35 prisoners there. Mm. Uh, so what's next is the job's not done. Guantanamo's still open. Until that's open, I'm going to keep fighting for it. Mm. But the job has expanded into different areas and regions. And we keep getting asked for, for help to work in, in some of those regions. Yeah. Where we can, we will. Where, where we can't, it's, it's, we'll have to try to help and empower others. Yeah. Uh, but the minimum we can do is at least keep those voices, uh, give those voices a platform, a place where we can uh, at least talk about them. One last question, actually. Um, I was, uh, alhamdulillah, I was in Medina last month and I met a group of Muslims from India and uh, they were despondent. They realized that, um, you know, there is a, a, a similar, uh, it's at a, a different stage, but there is a, a genocidal tendency, you know, of, of the Modi government. There is, a, uh, there is a move to malign the Muslim community. They're losing jobs. Their uh, economic uh, activities declining as a result of... Um, uh, being pariahs within the wider community. And, um, uh, you know, I, I asked them, okay, what, what, how can we help you? And, and um, they were sort of at a loss. They didn't really know what could be done from outside. I'm not sure if Cage has adopted the, the, the issue of India. I know you've, you've occasionally you've spoken about it, but I wonder if it's a project of yours. And, and again, what can we do about it? I note that there was a very brief period where it became an international issue. And, Many Muslims in UAE, if I remember right, began to boycott Indian products. But that was quite short-lived. How do we sustain that? And yeah, the earlier point about what's your, what's Cage's perspective on, on how we can help the Muslims of India? Um, so we've done a little bit. We've been touched. And often we get approached by people from Kashmir, which is a different, slightly yeah. different uh, subject. But yeah. they, they really get the issues. I'm surprised to the extent to which we got followers, get followers from Kashmir and listening and seeking uh, support, but also seeking guidance about how they can, uh, as if we, we're somehow, you know, we know how to guide them, which I don't think we do. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, it is 
it is really heartwarming to see the, that they're connected. Yeah. Uh, India is is a different kettle of fish. My my parents were both born in. My mother was born in uh, uh, Delhi. My father was born in Agra. Right. But I'm disconnected to the place totally. And um, after they moved to Pakistan, but there is a sense that uh, you know there's over a hundred million Muslims there. And for me, that being targeted by the Hindus is one thing, but a hundred million people, even if a fraction of you united and made uh, organizations for the defense, for the legal defense, for the physical defense, for the spiritual defense of your community, that would empower others to come and help you. That would say, okay, you know what, the Indians, first of all, they know how to stand up for themselves. That doesn't come across. However, one of the most, the lasting images that I have of, of an of a Indian person, def, Indian Muslim defending themselves was that young girl, mm-hmm. Maskan Khan. Yeah. Look at that bravery that that girl had. Amazing. It sent chills and shivers around across the Muslim world. Yeah. One woman, one girl, uh, with a whole mob of Hindutva thugs trying to intimidate her, and she won't get intimidated. And if she can do that one by herself, imagine there were hundreds of yeah. and men with her. Imagine they did that. And I, that's what we need to see. They need to do this. It cannot be put pressure on the Muslim world uh, while we don't organize ourselves. There must be a movement therein. But I've seen, unfortunately, some Indian ulama praising Modi. I've seen some, um, uh, some of them say this politics, don't get involved in politics. Right. What do you mean by don't get involved in politics when people are being beaten in your streets and made to say Jai Shri Ram for no reason yeah. other than this, uh, this uh, virulent Hindu for nationalism. So they need to stand up for themselves. Yeah. Ozenberg, you've got a lot of energy, I can see, and you give talks all over the country. Uh, you're giving a talk straight after this interview, alhamdulillah, and uh, Redbridge Islamic Center, I think it is. Yeah. Um, what motivates you? What keeps you going? Uh, what allows you to uh, to go out there and and to you know to give these khutbas and talks and events and debates and do your casework? What what makes you? What gives you the uh, the motivation to do all of that? Um, just uh, uh, increasingly, I will say that I hope that this some deed of mine Allah accepts. I don't know if it's going to be my prayers. I think I'm deficient in them. I think I'm deficient in my fasting, deficient in my zakat, deficient. Maybe this. Maybe this is it. Maybe this. Afdalu jihad, kalimatu haq, and the sultan in jair. Best jihad to speak a, a word of truth in front of oppressive rulers. Um, maybe that's something to do with it. I don't know. Um, but it's the hope that there's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts that is less deficient than everything else. May Allah accept from you. Jazakallah khair, Brother Mazen Beg, for a really enlightened interview. And, uh, thank you for absolute, your time today. My absolute pleasure, always. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website, thinkinmuslim.com, to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.